Uh, so today uh, I'll be speaking about uh, residential mass timber construction. So I'll first, uh, firstly start with an introduction to the products uh, that fall under the, uh, the, the that fall under mass timber. Uh, some of the considerations before choosing mass timber for a residential project. Uh, then I'll introduce the mass timber um, and then more, more accurately the CLT manufacturing process and explain the way to go about uh, navigating the design and shop drawing phases. I'll then explain the benefits of mass timber in residential construction uh, and uh, a bit of a comparison to commercial. Uh, and then we'll finish off with some case studies uh, of projects we've done more recently, as well as taking some questions. Uh, so to kick things off, I'll be introducing XLAM, uh, what we're about and uh, where we've come from. So the business uh, of XLAM started in New Zealand in 2012 with a small factory in Nelson at the top of the South Island. Uh, over, the, over the time, this expanded into a larger factory, however, still operating a mostly manual production facility. Uh, Exo New Zealand delivered many of its early iconic projects during that time, uh, as well as some early mass timber projects in Australia. In 2015, uh, the Mayflower Group, which is the Hine family who own Hine Timber, one of Australia's largest uh, timber sawmillers and stick frame distributors purchased XLAM uh, with the intention of investing a large sum of money in a new automated plant in Australia. Uh, this plant was situated in Albury Wodonga uh, region due to its close proximity to the plantation forest uh, and nearby sawmill at Tumbarumba in southern New South Wales, which is where the radiata pine is grown uh, that we manufacture the panels with. The location is just off the Hume Freeway uh, and has good access to the eastern seaboard of Australia, which is uh, where the mass timber market is its strongest in Australia. 2016 and 17 is when uh, we started to uh, set up the team in Australia, uh, where we continued to deliver projects out of the New Zealand plan up until the plant uh, in Australia opening in March 2018. Uh, we delivered over 80 projects in the first two years of production, uh, with the larger portion of these projects being residential. Uh, the balance was a mix of medium commercial, multi-res and a few larger commercial projects uh, such as the Adelaide Oval Hotel, the Kangaroo Point Monterey Apartments, um, the Iron Creek Homestay down in Tassie and more recently the Australian National University uh, RSPE projects and the Niall Office Building in Brisbane. Um, and although we decommissioned the New Zealand plant last year, uh, we continue to lead the mass timber market in New Zealand with iconic projects such as the Auckland City Mission, which we deliver through our Australian plant. Uh, so XLM are not just a CLT supplier, we offer uh, mass timber solutions to the market and can tailor a package to the needs of a project uh, across multiple disciplines. Uh, so including design under Nick Hewson's team. Uh, right through to installation services. Uh, we also offer a range of value add systems to the CLT. Uh, for example, we can coordinate and procure glue lamb, uh, steelwork, brackets, fixings, vapor membranes, uh, as well as just the timber elements. All right, so what is mass timber? Uh, mass timber refers to a range of engineered timber products uh, that sit below the mass timber umbrella. The cross laminated timber and glue laminated timber are by far the most widely used. Uh, LVL uh, more recently being used in mass timber projects as well as some other products like D uh, DLT and NLT uh, that are coming into the market. Cross laminated timber and glue lamb are by far the most popular used in residential uh, and commercial in mass timber. Um, they've got sort of uh, a longer history with um, with mass timber as well uh, as um, as uh, LVL uh, sort of more recently. So CLT itself uh, on the right hand side, you see three pictures. So the top is CLT, um, as the name suggests, it's uh, made up of multiple layers of boards of timber. So each layer runs 90 degrees to one another, which enables us to make sheets of solid timber elements. So we use these as floors, walls, uh, stairs, roof panels and things like that. Glue laminated timber is uh, similar in that it uses boards. However, they're all running in the same direction. Uh, this allows a single spanning um, beam, column, brace type uh, product. And then LVL is uh, sort of a like-for-like a, a -like product to glue lamb. Uh, however, it's made up of veneers uh, that are peeled from the log and glued back together rather than using boards. 
so firstly, I just wanted to introduce some example projects using mass timber uh, in residential, just to set the scene of where, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you can see from the images that this method of construction is uh, robust and uh, it's monolithic. It's um, very different to timber frame with individual elements uh, like studs and top and bottom plates and joists and bearings, uh, whereby they're substituted by solid timber elements. Uh, so when using it in residential, uh, the design process is somewhat different to traditional methods of construction. Uh, Mass Timber has some particularly good credentials in structural performance, as well as thermal acoustics, fire resistance, air tightness, uh, and so forth. The process to install, uh, connect, insulate, and weatherproof these buildings is not the same as timber frame, and it's important to research all the aspects of a project when considering Mass Timber. Um, choosing Mass Timber for a project should be done at the very early stages of the process, um, as early as possible. Uh, an example is prior to specifying external cladding buildups and insulation products. So when we talk about um, the commercial benefits of using Mass Timber, we discuss things like speed of installation, speed of construction, light weightness, uh, highly accurate, cost effective, However, these comparisons are generally to in-situ concrete structures. In residential, uh, we are rarely replacing concrete walls and suspended concrete floors, and hence the benefits are not always the same. So with comparisons to timber frame, the product is heavier. Um, you need a crane to install the panels. It's more expensive than timber frame on an outright cost. It is quick to install, yes, but will a residential builder see those genuine improvements to the overall build time? And will the client uh, see those cost benefits passed on? So these additional benefits depend on how the whole project is procured and delivered and managed. So this is a product uh, for the higher end residential market. Uh, trying to compete with uh, on cost with volume builders is just not possible. Uh, Mass Timber is a superior residential building product and uh, this quality should be appreciated uh, when considering budget constraints as well as the specific drivers behind your project. So for example, is the client, uh, is this someone's custom design forever home uh, that is targeting certain passive design principles? If yes, then Mass Timber is an excellent consideration for that. Um, it's not the only one, but it is an excellent consideration. If a client uh, is, likes the look of high grade exposed timber, but has a constricted budget, then timber frame clad internally with a hardwood would be a far more cost effective solution. The point here is that uh, mass timber should be used for its strengths. Uh, if you're thinking of designing a home with mass timber in mind, then uh, you should be thinking things like what air tightness do I want to achieve? Can I insulate enough to avoid uh, putting ducted heating and cooling in? Am I using the most effective orientation of the block? Uh, am I prepared to spend money on high performance windows and doors? Do I have the right budget? These are the right questions. Uh, always consider the specific drivers of a project before going too far down um, a mass timber journey that, that is not obtainable. And cost is always uh, the biggest hurdle. At the end of the day, if the key drivers are, are just not there, uh, you'll be paying a high price for a home that might not really outperform a traditionally built home. And what I mean by that is, uh, yes, you'll still be getting a superior product, uh, no doubt, but you'll still be paying high power bills. Uh, you'll need to supplement um, heating and cooling. Uh, you'll, you'll potentially still have drafts etc. Um, the supply and install cost of mass timber though is uh, not just the only consideration. So consider within your budget uh, how much further performance do you want to get uh, above and beyond what just the product alone is giving you. And those things are like air tightness, um, insulation properties, things like that. Uh, it's also important to choose the right consultants, builder and installers, um, ones that understand the process behind off-site procurement. So contact suppliers early in the design process so that they can assist with uh, pre preliminary budgeting and offer any cost effective improvements uh, at a time when you have the ability to do something about it. Um, make sure that you spend the time to research mass timber and passive design principles. Uh, speak to builders early and choose ones that will program and prioritize your project from start to finish. Uh, and don't, don't attempt to rush the project and set the expectations right at the start.
Uh, Mass Timber is not a magical product that it will solve all your problems. There are places to use it, but there are some obvious places not to use it as well. Uh, so CLT considerations now. Um, I'm now going to talk more specifically about cross laminated timber. Uh, the nature of CLT as a panel type product uh, sees it being used in residential construction far more than any other mass timber product. So floors, walls, roof panels, et cetera, rather than post and beam type construction that uh, you know, LVL and glue and that leans more towards commercial projects. Uh, generally speaking, all CLT suppliers will prefer to manufacture uh, large, low complexity panels. And this is a factory's bread and butter work really. Uh, hence why it's the most cost effective to purchase. It's not always this, uh, that simple with highly architectural designs having non-rectangular shapes and unique geometry, but consider that the square meter cost will go up the more complex and uniquely shaped the panel is or the project is. Also consider that installers will generally price for number of lifts. Uh, so larger panels will reduce install costs uh, and also the cost of fewer connections. Some examples are here, uh, large rectangular thick floor panels at the top versus multiple uh, more complex thinner wall panels at the bottom. The further down the list you go, uh, the higher the complexity, the smaller the panel, the higher the cost. Another great example here for residential, um, two of the same wall elevations, one uh, larger panel at the top with uh, the windows removed as wastage um, versus framing uh, with multiple walls and lintels. The top option will always be a more cost effective one. You are paying for um, the material of the windows and doors, but the rate of the, of the panel that you're buying is, is a lot cheaper than um, the smaller panels in the bottom option. So yes, you're saving uh, the timber fiber, but you're also adding nine lifts on site compared to one. Uh, you've now uh, got all these extra connections to be made um, and a lot more cost. Connection design is another important driver behind complexity. Uh, so focus on connections that don't require heavy machining um, and hidden slots and rebates for plates, et cetera, unless absolutely necessary. So some examples, the right, the, the left-hand one here, um, a cast in connection in concrete that required some heavy machining to the CLT and no tolerance for concrete uh, in that option. Whereas the right-hand option is a very simple solution for residential connections to concrete slab on ground. Uh, no machining required at the bases of the walls, just cut plumb uh, allowance for packing and, and tolerances on site. Uh, here's an example of um, the same size billet. So when we say billet, this refers to our sort of major panel that we press. Um, uh, it's like the, the raw panel that comes out of the press before it goes into the CNC. I'll explain more on that later. So one, one example with a single floor panel and the other with several uh, high complexity panels, 23 minutes for the top option versus 140 minutes to make the bottom one. Uh, so I'm sure this illustrates how costs for CLT can increase considerably dependent on the design uh, and why it's even more important to speak to the suppliers early and avoid these costs where possible. Uh, I think it's important now uh, to know how CLT is made uh, as, as this will hopefully provide some background uh, to any of the limitations of the product. So we start with uh, random length packs of rough sawn uh, timber uh, boards, uh, various sizes and shapes, but um, we, we could feed in uh, any, any length uh, of board. We, we then finger join that together to essentially make an infinitely long board, which we can cut back down to the size of the billet that we're pressing. Those uh, boards are then planed to a, a, an accurate dimension uh, on all four sides. They're laid up and glued and pressed in a, a, a mechanical uh, press uh, to make the billets. And then we uh, put them through the CNC machine to cut into the finished panels. This is the internal of our factory uh, up in uh, Banawatha, just outside of Wodonga. So we start with that process at the back here, the back corner where we infeed the rough sawn timber and it makes its way through the, the factory, the, the planer sits in there, the layout for the press into the press. And then once we finish that, the billets will come out of the press and go around to the CMC. 
Uh, this side of the factory is just for production of the billets and this side is the finishing, the finishing part where we cut the panels up. This is our CNC machine. It's a Hyundai PBA uh, machine. We now have two of them side by side. Um, an operator stands on the outside and runs the program that we designed through the shop drawings. Uh, and within that enclosure is all the machinery um, and tooling that we use to process the panels. We try to do 100% of the machining in the CNC's um, and do as little as possible by hand afterwards. Sometimes the tooling won't allow that, but um, most of the time we can get all the processes done in the CNC. Here's an example of the um, tooling we have. So disc mills, large diameter saws, chainsaws, drill bits and routers, um, so forth. So we even have things in there like pen marking tools if we need to mark, uh, mark any, any um, set out on the panels and things like that as well. So um, our factory considerations, they're all, um, all the suppliers will be slightly different, but uh, we have, um, because we operate a mechanical press, um, it uh, uses hydraulic rams to press the panels together. We have a minimum billet size as well as a maximum. So 2.4 by 6 metres is the smallest and 3.4 by 15.9 is the largest. I'll give you an example. Um, an 1,800 millimetre wide panel for us is problematic because we, we can't put two 1,800 side by side because it's too wide uh, and it's lower than our minimum width. So we would have to press a 2.4 panel and cut 600 mil off the side and, wait, and it would be wastage. So that range between sort of 1700 and 2300 is, is problematic. So always sort of just consider that, but again, every supply is different. So you won't get that sort of information unless you speak to them early. Uh, transport capabilities, um, pretty much anywhere in Australia, uh, 13 meters to 2.5 is within what we call within gauge. So we can get to any, any job site fairly easily. Um, all of our transport is done on semi-trailers, so uh, allow up to sort of 20 metre um, prime movers with a, with a detachable trailer. We can transport um, the full billets, uh, the full width maximum billet, so 16 by three and a half um, package, packaged up. Um, however, this requires special escorts. Anything over 2.5 uh, will require an escort into site in most CBD locations or, or metro locations. Um, Melbourne's a bit better than Sydney, um, so just consider as well that uh, as soon as you go over 2.5, you might as well go to 3.4 panel size because um, the cost for transport will be about the same and you'll get more efficiencies, more um, you know, less lifts on site, less connections and so forth. So CMC complexity and panel size will determine uh, the time it takes to process one of our billets through the press, um, through the CMC, sorry. So the goal for us is to have our press running at full capacity, which means that as we're outputting billets from that press, the CNCs are keeping up. Um, if the CNCs are taking too long to process a panel, that can backlog and stop the press from continuing, and that is not very efficient for us. So um, larger, lower complexity panels are most efficient, um, but we do have a buffer zone. So obviously in residential, we get some fairly complex panels. Uh, we have the ability to sort of put them in, in amongst some easier billets to, to alleviate any uh, downtime on the press. Uh, so once you've decided to use mass timber on your projects, uh, you'll need to get an architect and an engineer on board uh, to complete the design. Uh, and uh, hopefully with supply input along the way. Uh, once this is completed, you'll engage a supplier. Uh, shop drawings will then be the first stage of that supply process. And without a doubt, it is the most important stage. Uh, so for us to start shop drawings, the design should be at 100% uh, completion. So uh, fully coordinated, we, we need to have finalised information before we start shop drawings as we are essentially produce, producing an as-built model. Um, and set a set of drawings for production at that stage. There's really no point starting that process uh, where the goalposts are moving and the design is not completed. But people tend to underestimate um, how long that process takes to coordinate when you're dealing with prefabricated technologies. And that's not just mass timber, that's, um, that's other, other, um, other prefabricated technologies as well. Uh, you can't avoid having to do that coordination to that level of detail. So it's either done properly at the start or attempts are made through that coordination and shop drawing process to, to do that. And, um, and that leads to a stressful and difficult process that can also lead to delays, to redrafting fees and to a lot of risk. 
So risk of errors not being picked up uh, from that coordination, uh, which causes issues and more costs on site. You can very quickly lose the efficiency of a mass timber project um, by a lack of coordination. Anyway, I'm going to cover off on a lot more of that later, so I will stop ranting on that for now. So step one, uh, after you give us your uh, beautiful, fully coordinated, not one millimetre out of place drawings and CAD files, we would begin our fabrication models. So we start uh, with using the final and frozen architectural drawings. We develop a geometric model uh, with effectively the as-built set out. That includes all the windows and door openings, et cetera. Step two, uh, we then introduce all the detailed connections. So we start panelizing the project into its final panels, adding any specific CNC detailing required, so pockets or brackets for beams and connections, drill bits, uh, so drillings for um, bolts and dowels, uh, and even services penetrations if they've been coordinated. Uh, we send the model out for review at that stage so that we can agree that the geometry is correct, uh, the panels are the correct size and all the details are correct. Uh, it's only once this is reviewed and approved should we then proceed into 2D drawings. I just want to pause here a little bit and talk for a second about the 3D model because I do see a huge um, opportunity with uh, the way that we currently run this process. Because a lot of uh, a lot of the time we get consultants that aren't comfortable with 3D and it and it makes that process a lot more difficult to run. So the fabrication model for us is the single most important step in the whole process. Uh, it's from the model that we generate our CAD CAM files for the CNC. So I know that whatever's in that model is going to be um, processed in the CNC. It's going to be exactly within the tolerance of the CNC of one or two millimeters is going to be the panel that arrives on site. Um, all the other 2D drawings, the set out plans, the sequence drawings, details, sections, elevations, they're all there to assist with the overall um, approval process and the site installation. I honestly believe though, um, it's not that difficult to review, approve, and even install a project without the 2D drawings. Um, and in fact, I think it's fairly easy. Uh, the problem is um, that it requires everyone to work in 3D. That includes the architect, the engineer, the builder, and the installer. Now we've done that um, very successfully on a number of projects operating this way, not so much in the install, but a lot with the coordination. Um, everyone needs to be comfortable with reviewing 3D models. So that's like taking screenshots and making comments rather than having a set of 2D drawings where you'll mark up. Um, there are many out there that have this ability, but unfortunately it very rarely happens that they're all working on the same project together. And as soon as one person can't, can't work in 3D, we have to go through that 2D process. Uh, the 3D uh, model also has far more information that's easily accessible than 2D drawings. So I can go into any of our fabrication models um, and build them up one by one with the installation sequence. I can take any dimensions that I'll ever need. Uh, I can click on a panel and look at properties such as treatments, visual grades, uh, its production number, the weight of the panel, in, even in what pack and on what truck it's going to arrive on. But even more importantly, uh, I can easily diagnose problems on site from within the model because I know that that 3D model is what was sent to the factory for the, for the CNC. So if a panel's wrong on site and it's not fitting in its location, uh, you know, you can easily use the model to find out what's gone wrong, but even more critically, what you can do to fix it without delaying the site team. So there's a lot of efficiencies to be made in 3D that I think a lot of people leave on the table um, just by simply following that 2D process that they're used to. Uh, so step three uh, then adds in the installation sequence. Um, this is done again prior to moving into 2D drawings. So this determines the orientation of the lap joints, the final size of the panels, the packaging sequences, uh, this is the stage where we also check crane capacities on site and panel weights. So we need that information um, up front. Uh, then we start the 2D set out drawings, the so detailed dimension drawings to grid lines. Uh, this includes any critical sections and elevations that we need to illustrate uh, in order to um, convey the information to install and approve the, the, the job. Uh, the 2D drawings are just a snapshot of the 3D model, however. So it's, it's a manual snapshot, which is then manually dimensioned and annotated. So it's from these drawings and the model that we seek the sign off for manufacture. Um, 
Step five, we then complete uh, our loading diagrams and QA drawings. So this doesn't form part of the approval process, uh, but it will form part of the issue for construction package that we send out. So the loading diagrams will show you what's coming on what truck in what order. So we always try to avoid uh, reshuffling of panels as much as safely possible. You'll also get your individual QA drawings of every panel um, that, you know, if you need to check anything on site. So it's at this, it's at this stage that the design team um, will hand over to the factory. So then step six, um, the factory will then nest the panels onto an, uh, in an optimal way onto the billets for production. Uh, they'll then allocate the CNC tooling that we um, will decide on to cut the panels. Uh, and then we go into production after that. Then we're on site after that. Uh, so everything I've spoken about uh, in regards to the processes and considerations with Mass Timber uh, shop drawing process, these are all relevant across both commercial and resi projects. But what I want to do now is hone in more onto the specifics of um, the residential projects. So first the comparison though. Um, so commercial is quite a different, um, quite different to the domestic market. So commercial builders are generally more experienced in larger scale coordination and project management. These projects most often have uh, reputable architects and engineers who are more experienced and confident in offside coordination in the 3D modeling process in shop drawing reviews. Um, domestic construction is still largely that sort of make it fit on site philosophy. So builders tend to simply follow a set of drawings, whether that be from a building designer or an architect, if you're lucky, uh, and use their experience, uh, know-how and the resi framing code to build the project traditionally using labor and mostly raw materials on site. So I'm somewhat stereotyping there for the purpose of the argument, as I know there's many, uh, really, really good builders out there, but, uh, so please don't take offense to that, but, um, that domestic mindset is then somewhat challenging when trying to then introduce new and sophisticated off-site products, uh, whether that be mass timber or cassette modules, bathroom pods and the like, as it's, it not only requires uh, a different sort of thinking, but a shift in the way that you manage the project. Uh, so all, all prefabricated building technologies require a coordination and shop drawing phase. Uh, some are more streamlined than others, but almost all require an earlier investment in design than would otherwise be required with a traditional on-site model. The one exemption to this rule might be frame and truss, as these guys are, are very mature in the resi construction sector. Uh, their product's also basically the same product as what's been built on site, as, as in a, as a timber frame, but it's just been built off-site. So a prefab frame um, is more easily massaged and manipulated on site if issues arise. You, you can't easily do that with any other technology, at least not with mass timber. Um, with prefabrication, what you're doing is you're essentially taking that on site labour component uh, and you're putting them in factories six weeks earlier or in offices as project managers and design managers 12 weeks earlier. Now you should see a net reduction in labour and cost due to that efficiency of factory production versus on-site construction. For example, a carpenter spends eight hours on-site to manually perform a task that can be done semi-autonomously in a factory in four hours with an hour of shop drawing and an hour of management behind that. So you've got six hours versus eight hours. You should see cost improvements there. The problem is that we see is that builders tend to expect those cost benefits of the reduced labour on-site from prefab, but ignore that requirement to uh, invest in the upfront design process. And what then happens is that most of the efficiencies of off-site off um, procurement fly out the window. Uh, a lot of the coordination is being handled by the suppliers and the consultant team, but the builder is, is really the glue that holds all that together. So unfortunately, this tends to happen a lot uh, more on the domestic projects. Um, some builders don't necessarily have the ability to adapt to an off-site procurement model and try to make it work within the boundaries of what they've always done. What you then see is that the prefab supplier is in their own little bubble with a, a, a lack of support, I suppose, battling to get those shop drawings coordinated for them. Um, but see, every single project that we do, something will come up during the shop drawing phase that, uh, that doesn't quite work within the design we've been provided. Uh, so things like the connection details might be, some might be missing, some might not work quite as, as expected. Uh, we might realise that the walls haven't been drawn at the exact right thickness. Um, whatever it is, uh, we need that support from the whole team to resolve it. 
And at the end of the day, uh, we will finish our shop drawings, the product goes into production, uh, and then arrives on site, uh, and more often than not in residential, everything reverts back to that old thinking. So the windows, the joinery is site measured, the timber sits out in the weather for weeks before lockup, and this leads to damages, to mold, discoloration, bowing of panels, and this all creates unnecessary costs that can easily be mitigated with proper management. So without a shift in old thinking, uh, you cannot expect to see uh, the, co the complete benefits of mass timber and offsite uh, construction. The so coordination or lack thereof is, is that sort of single largest driver in the financial success of a project. The material costs are higher, the design costs are higher. The only way to close that gap is in project management. So I've left this slide up for a while now, um, just so you can get a picture of what I mean with offsite procurement versus uh, traditional. So traditional construction uh, sees a relatively cheap design stage with a quick mobilization on site and a lengthy construction phase. Uh, the design phase will also continue well into the construction phase. Offsite construction sees a larger investment in upfront design uh, and a longer lead time before you can commence on site. Um, you have a small overlap with the design and construction due to the well-coordinated design phase. Uh, the material costs are higher, but you have the opportunity to close that cost gap with uh, a reduced construction phase. But keeping in mind that you're still using a superior building product that costs more, uh, as you know, costs more for the product compared to timber frame. If managed poorly, however, the construction phase will still be long. Uh, the overall start to finish time even longer than traditional, and the cost would most certainly be higher. Uh, so with an overview of resi construction disadvantages now, I'm going to also take the opportunity to show some of the sort of the, the issues that you might face um, on site. So I'm just going to run through these. The, um, the, the longer upfront design duration, uh, lead times to procure materials longer, outright cost compared to timber frames higher, and the following cost advantages again aren't really um, recognised uh, without that proper management. A couple of examples here with the uh, the uh, mild steel plates that can rust, rust standing on visual wall panels, uh, timber left out in the weather, sees heavy discoloration, cupping, board gaps opening. Um, water management on site is quite an important consideration. Costs can become quite significant if the complexity is high. Uh, difficult to coordinate if other structures on site are built traditionally. So what I mean by this is uh, with Resi, we get a lot of projects coming in that are like building extensions, so vertical extensions or an extension out uh, to one of the sides. Um, this is difficult because the design phase is, uh, you know, we need all that information up front. And if you're having to wait to do site measures and, and things like that, it does get a bit more complicated. So if you are looking at doing uh, extensions, uh, I would recommend that you, especially if you're going outwards rather than upwards, that you try to build that new design as a sort of completely disconnected building and then have a small area where you can infill on site, depending on what the existing structure is doing once you start to demo it. Uh, mass timber does require a crane and good site access for installation, and it does require an upskill of labour on site. Uh, there are other options there with uh, dedicated mass timber specialists for installs that are available as well. Uh, so some here, examples, um, weather related damages again, left out in the weather, some cracking, a bit of delamination unfortunately there, and some panels that got some water damage. Uh, that's very difficult to get out on visual panels as well. Positives though, uh, the advantages are, it is a far superior structure than conventional materials. Um, lower carbon footprint, you've got a uh, significant improvement in speed of construction when it's managed properly. Very low noise and disruptions to the neighbours, uh, less trucks coming and going from site. And it's a cleaner job site just generally because there's less materials, there's less wastages. These are, this is the Meriwalt project, which I'll go through the series project down in um, Geelong, I'll go through shortly as well. Uh, little to no waste on site, so you also got re reduced, uh, reduced skip bins and costs there. Uh, it is inherently an airtight construction, so you got healthier homes from that, especially when you do it right with uh, membranes and, and the like. Fast and accurate construction. Uh, and then you also have those other benefits, um, you know, with thermal, fire and acoustic performance of the product, which uh, might not be, I suppose, required with residue construction, but you will get anyway. 
Uh, so a couple of case studies now. Uh, firstly, the seed house. This is uh, this is James Fitzpatrick's house. Um, so James uh, works at the Fitzpatrick and Partners. So they were the architectural uh, designers for this project. Sits on the edge of a cliff in Sydney. Um, very highly complex geometry. This is a multi-million dollar build, several million dollar build. Uh, so again, we're provided with really, really high quality architectural documentation to start our process. Uh, engineers TTW provided a, a raft of details uh, of all the unique connections on the job. So really, really, uh, really well detailed. This allows us to produce our fabrication models. Um, so all the individual panels showing all the lap joints, all the tolerances and that. We can then go into our 2D drawing process. Uh, so set out drawings, uh, sequence of installation, packaging sequences, uh, 3D isometrics and so forth. And then we get out on site. So this is some examples here. Uh, these sites are generally run with about four to six people uh, plus a crane crew. It's one of the only jobs in residential I've ever seen to have a tower crane on it. Um, so you can obviously appreciate it was a fairly large uh, and uh, complex build. And this is the finished product. So a really, really excellent use of mass timber. It did push the boundaries of the product. So we've got some areas where uh, we've got some modules sort of cantilevering off the, off the edge of the slope there, activating the walls as deep beams and things like that. Uh, heavy, heavy use of timber, um, not just the CLT exposed, but also other species of timber that's around the, the, the um, house. Uh, as well as other uh, products like stones and concretes and, and metals and things like that um, as well. Uh, everything on this job was just custom built, even handrails and, and the staircase. God forbid, please don't order one of these because it was hugely expensive to manufacture in the CMC. Uh, and uh, some examples here of the exposed CLT members here. So again, hardwood, uh, I think it was hardwood flooring, a lot of other timber elements used as well. Uh, the other case study here is the series house. So this is um, this is down in uh, near, near Geelong in Victoria. So again, we start with really high quality uh, architectural models and drawings. This is uh, Nadine from Level AK. Uh, had some uh, really really excellent Revit models. We could then isolate the structure from there to start producing our um, our fabrication model from. Uh, Viztech, Nathan did a really, really good job here coordinating uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the shop drawing phase through the um, through the three model, like I outlined before. Same with Nadine. So that process worked really, really well with this job because we could just start coordinating through three D and bouncing models between each other to refine that before we moved into two D. Uh, Vistec then produced a whole uh, series of uh, detailed drawings for the connections. So we got about a dozen pages of all the specific details here all the individual elements showing what ha has to happen because this was a fairly complex geometry. Uh, and again, still getting detailed set out drawings from, an art, from the architectural point of view, just to assist with setting out that fabrication model for us. Our model um, can then be uh, produced. So this job itself is a glue lamb, predominantly glue lamb post and beam um, sort of portal frame design with CLT roofs, mid floors and walls. Highly, um, highly visible um, internally with the timber as well. We then produce all of our 2D drawings, set out plans, loading drawings, panel drawings. So that allows us to coordinate the installation on site very effectively. And these are some examples midway through construction. So a very, very large footprint of the building. I uh, can't remember the square meters of it, but it was massive. I think it was about six or 700 square meters total um, footprint. And uh, so the building itself is just in the final stage of fit out. We delivered the project last year. Um, obviously uh, it's already past the lockup stage now, but it's a heavy, heavy use of interior um, exposed timbers, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of other uh, stones and concretes and things like that as well to complement the timber. A uh, good story about the staircase. There was an old cottage on the property which uh, was was sort of partly demolished uh, before building the new structure. So they've recycled a lot of the uh, stone in the, in the staircase, which is a great story there. All right, and that concludes the presentation for today. So thanks very much for listening, everyone, and we'll take some questions.
All right, fantastic presentation. Thanks for that. Look, um, we've had uh, some great questions, so we've got a bit of time to, to answer some of those. So that's, uh, that's very valuable. So look, we've had a number of questions, as you would expect, around cost, <coughs> um, even though you didn't cover that in detail in terms of uh, um, specific numbers. But um, do you want to just make a comment around, around cost of CLT and residential compared to traditional construction? And I suppose... Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the same price as building a stick house, but but what are the benefits we get for the additional cost? Yeah, okay. So, um, look, I suppose I'm not too sure the difference between the outright costs. I'm not very, uh, you know, overly familiar with timber frame costs, but I know that it is smart, like a, a considerably, um, you know, more expensive product, but you are obviously purchasing a, a very high-end product. So, you know, CLT in itself is like, you know, you've got a stud wall at 600 centres, this is essentially putting those studs at 45 millimeter centers and making a solid timber. So you've got a lot more fiber of timber that you're putting in the project. Um, but that inherently has benefits like uh, air tightness, thermal performance that you're getting um, with that product too. So uh, those costs, um, you know, the upfront comparison of the structure costs are one thing, but then again, like I mentioned, it all does come down to that sort of where you can then grab those costs back in, in how efficient that you deliver the projects. Um, even things to the, you know, details like uh, plasterboard is easier to apply to a CLT wall than a timber frame because you've got a solid substrate. You know, everything's dead straight. So installing your architraves is a lot easier without having to find the, the bottom plates and line everything up and straighten the walls. And those sorts of follow-on things with mass timber, um, they can sometimes sort of be left on the table if they're not, you know, if you don't really understand that process uh, to that sort of degree. Um, I think overall, though, you know, Mass Timber is is targeting that higher end residential. So, you know, these are projects from. It's hard to tell, I suppose, hard to discuss costs with, um, depending on looking at the job. But you know, you're talking eight hundred thousand to multi million dollar builds. These these are not sort of the, the three or four hundred thousand dollar four bedroom homes um, that, that the volume builders can sort of deliver to. Yeah, I might just add a few words to that, Tyson, with the interview work we've done through uh, Forest and Wood Products Australia and Wood Solutions with the top 100 builders. Interestingly, they've all heard of CLT and a lot of them have had a bit of a look at it. Again, as you mentioned, volume builders all about uh, sort of price points and costing. So clearly this is going to be more expensive than a lightweight framed home, as you rightly described. But actually, they're quite interested in certain applications, particularly in some cases with perhaps CLT floor panels. It might be sort of simpler to do. And, and also, uh, obviously, that Perth market's an interesting one, I think, uh, which is traditionally sort of double brick and sort of suspended concrete CLT might actually, you know, have a crack into the residential market there. But but I think you're right. It is a much more specialised uh, material in, in this sort of residential sector. Um, we, we've also had a, a question here, which a number of people have also um, keen to get an answer on just around the software. <clears throat> it says, uh, since 3D software seems crucial to coordinate the project, it's important which software is being used, and if so, which one do you prefer to work with? And they've made some suggestions, Archicad, Revit, Rhino, and so on. Yep, yep. Um, look, we, we normally communicate with IFC model format, so that, that can translate across uh, mostly all of those sort of software packages in the industry today. Uh, specifically, we use a program called CADWORK internally, uh, at least at XLAM. Uh, there's other ones available like HSB CAD that's a, sort of part of that um, Autodesk, I think, software package. Um, so that's very specific because it, it allows us to communicate with the CNC machines, but we can communicate through IFC format. So yeah, Revit, Revit's one of the more popular. Um, Rhino, yeah, the ones you've mentioned, yeah, again, Archicad, we've seen them coming before with, with not, you know, no issues there. Um, it is a little bit different sometimes when we've got a client that's actually doing sort of our fabrication model. So they're kind of having a crack at doing the actual panel splits and doing that coordination up front. Um, that, that then means that it's crucial that we can convert that into our software. And I think sometimes with uh, programs, I think Archicad does have some issues with that sometimes, but I'm not too familiar there. It's probably best to speak with your suppliers as early as you can, just to make sure that, you know, do a, do a trial run with a panel or something like that in 3D, just to make sure that it's coming across all right. A question here, which is sort of typical with residential um, types of constructions, you said at the start, uh, is the builder able to cut out sections for windows on site, e.g. the owner decides they want an extra window after delivery, and would that affect the structural adequacy of the panel? Yeah, um, definitely, yeah, definitely no issues with, with um, obviously doing your own cutting on site. Obviously, you need to check that with your engineer to make sure that load-bearing elements are still operating, you know, within their design um, intent. Uh, 
but yeah, look, uh, and, and often is the case where, like that example I gave you with the wall uh, in residential where we, we cut out those windows and that's the way we prefer to do it, uh, we can leave those panels in and do all the pilot cuts for you to cut the material out on site and, and keep the off cut for whatever you want to do with it, a furniture panel or, or whatever. But um, you know, we end up just, uh, that ends up going through a recycling process where it's chipped and recycled in our plant. So if you want that material, you can keep it as well. Yep. And um, someone's asked here about uh, being in installing it. Uh, what kind of upskilling is required when looking um, to become an installer? Ha what does the builder have to do? Anything special? Yeah, look, um, it's very similar to like most, like precast concrete is probably the, the most uh, most akin sort of uh, material to, to it because it's a panelised system that you're lifting in uh, with a crane, different um, lifting methodologies we use. But it's more just about understanding that process of how the trucks are arriving. It's just because it's different to building with a piece of, you know, sticks of timber. It's a, it's a large front panel. So, you, you know, anyone with that knowledge of, precast concrete um, to an extent uh, would, would pick it up pretty easily. Um, it's not like, it's not rocket science. It's just, it's timber panels being installed. So they're screwed together with basic screws and brackets and it's all fairly straightforward. So uh, don't get too, don't get too um, concerned with the, the amount of education you're going to need to go through. It's um, and, and look, the suppliers and especially us are there to assist through that, that education too, if you've got any questions. Mm -hmm. And just back with that sort of modelling phase that you do, someone's asked, uh, is your fabrication model built from the structural or the architectural drawings? Oh, definitely the architecturals. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the architect drives the geometry of a project. The, 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 the engineer, uh, you know, never would, would never take responsibility for the, for the geometry and the dimensions and everything. They don't usually provide dimension drawings anyway. It's more just showing the design intent with the connections. Yeah, we always follow the architecturals. And with the software, how's the installation sequence and delivery information uh, determined? Is that manual or automated through the software? Uh, if you're looking at the model, it is automated. We have uh, the IFC that we output will have the, um, the production sequence added to it. So you can simply sort of click and hide and show and build, you know, build the model up um, through that model. Uh, with the installation sequence. Uh, we then do, at the moment, obviously, with the 2D drawings, we produce a, a set of isometric um, staging drawings showing the numbers. It's just a simple sort of staging showing the number and the weight so that you can just have those drawings there to follow on site as well. And um, as we sort of need to do with residential in certain parts of Australia where it comes to protection from termites, how do you deal with the termite protection in these residential projects? Yeah, there's a couple of ways. So if you, you know, obviously if the timber's raised above the ground and you've got, um, you know, termite barriers and that sort of thing, then you can uh, um, sort of avoid having to do it in, I think above the Tropic of Capricorn, is it that uh, you need to have treated timbers. We, you know, XLAM can do treated H3 termite protected timber uh, all through the panel. So we can, uh, that starts with the rough sawn boards that go into our plant are already impregnated with a treatment. And that means that any, any site cutting or any amendments that are made, any processing through the CNC means that those fresh cups are still protected internally. Um, so there's definitely options available there. Of course, they come at an additional cost um, to the untreated panel that we, we have as standard. Yep. Uh, just, I will add, sorry, Alice. So we, we, um, we do uh, put H3 treated panels in uh, all wet areas of our projects too. So any set down areas where underneath um, bathrooms or on balconies and, and, the, and the like, we would, um, we would always put in a treated panel in those scenarios too. Yep. And there's a couple of questions here just around services and um, sort of where you into incorporate that into the building process and also yeah, how do you deal with sort of PowerPoints and uh, water lines and things on site? Uh, yeah, so services can be coordinated, like not always with residential because obviously you don't, you know, you don't have services consultants that are doing drawings and models enough for you to coordinate that process. But um, you know, drilling plumbing holes and things like that. As long as it's coordinated and we have that information up front, we will just process all that in the CMC. But again, if you don't have the ability to do that uh, up front, then um, you can cut those things on site. Um, you know, you can drill. It's just timber. So, you know, if you have to do a 100 mil hole, it's, if it's, if it's the odd one here and there, you can use a hole saw and chip it out and get, you know, get your way through it. But there are other, you know, installers nowadays have got access to sort of specialised equipment for core drilling bigger holes and things like that. Um, chainsaws can be used to cut bigger openings. So things like that on site is, you know, fairly straightforward carpentry work. Mm. 
There's a couple of questions there just around uh, use of these type of structures in bushfire prone areas. Um, do you see that as a problem? Uh, well, not really. I mean, bushfire prone areas, uh, you can build in timber frame. It's just more about the claddings and the build ups you use, especially in flame zone areas where you've got a uh, requirement for, I think, a 60 minute FRL. So our, our panels will provide an FRL as well. So you can use them externally, you know, or not externally, but the external walls can be used. To, um, or, or all the whole, you know, the whole build can be used uh, internally as well. Um, so I don't see any issues with bell, yeah, bell affected areas. So, yeah. mm. and, and again, a couple of questions just around external walls where you might be using CLT. Like, how do you deal with that on the outside? Um, do you still need building wraps, air barriers, those type of things? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it's a different it's a different process to timber frame. So, you know, timber frame, you've got the opportunity to insulate within those studs. Um, CLT, it's solid. So you have to insulate on the outside, uh, always on the outside. I think the, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but <laughs> I think the whole point is that you need to keep the timber warm and that reduces that risk of any condensation occurring within the panel. Um, and then, yeah, you'll need like, you know, these sorts of homes that we're doing are you know, passively designed. So you've got things like, uh, vapor permeable membranes and, and those rigid insulation boards uh, that, that are going on top of that. Um, but generally, yeah, you know, using mass timber, you'd, you'd generally have a lightweight uh, cladding like a color bond or a cement sheet or core 10 steel or anything like that, that um, rather than like a brick veneer home, you wouldn't be building out of uh, mass timber. Yep. You did mention earlier on about um, one of the benefits of CLT panels is its thermal performance. Um, do you have any information around the R value of the panels? Yeah, um, the R value is not particularly high. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why, but um, you will get some contribution to R value. So I think, uh, as an example, a 100 mil panel will give you about a 0.8 uh, R value. 0 0.8 um, and it just depends on the thickness of the panel so there's a formula to work out the r value so we can give the information about that but you will you will need to use uh, other insulation products on top of it but yes it will contribute to the r value yep there's a question here just around the clt panels what timber species are available in clt and, and are any are australian native hardwoods currently being used or mm. are they going to be used yeah, uh, so we manufacture with radiata pine. Um, you know, softwood we grow in uh, southern New South Wales. Uh, that's the only product that we we put in a CLT because it's just the basis of what we've you know what we've fire tested. All the structural performances are based on that that product. So uh, at the moment, yeah, the the plant might have the ability to run different species, but you know it's got to go through a whole sort of development process there. So. I know there are other suppliers around that have, um, you know, certainly Europeans have a lot of spruce and fir in their CLT panels. Um, there's CLT Key down in Burnie and Tassie. They're, they're doing the uh, eucalyptus nidens hardwood uh, CLT as well. So, yeah, there's a few around. Different, yeah, different suppliers have different species, but, um, you know, yeah, we're, we're in the radiata pine softwood um, for ours. Just a question here about treated timber and uh, just ask, talking about treated timber, what do you do with regards to a panel sitting on a slab due to moisture? Is it better to put a treated floor plate in first to save treating of panels? Yeah, look, if you've got a slab on ground, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put an additional CLT floor on. Your cost would just be uh, exorbitant to, to do that. Um, we normally, down to concrete slabs, we'll normally have a 20 to 30 mil gap and that's more to allow for tolerances in a slab because... It, you know, you need to allow for those tolerance gaps. Um, so inherently it is sitting above that moisture level. Uh, we, we don't generally have too many issues on, on uh, slabs on ground with that because, you know, you've got water runoff and the slab edge is normally sort of well protected from moisture getting in externally once the, the building's built. Um, and then under that void, uh, you know, depending on what you're achieving on site, you, you might need to grout and dry pack that and seal it for air tightness or um, you know you can use additional packers to distribute the load and then just um, seal that externally and internally with an architrave and a, a, any claddings and that. Well that's fantastic Tyson I think we've got through most of the questions and we're just done 12 o'clock so uh, thank you for a terrific presentation and give you a virtual clap for everyone online nice. so it's really, uh, really appreciated. I just um, remind uh, those people that um, wanted to get the CPD, these are the um, CPD questions we were asking for. So if you didn't already, perhaps just uh, grab a screenshot of that, um, but they should be emailed out to you anyway afterwards. 
So uh, next Tuesday at uh, 11 a.m., we have a webinar on the deemed to satisfy um, fire resistance requirements of timber connectors. So that'll be fascinating for all of those people that are interested in use of timber and mid-rise type construction and how you deal with some of these fire requirements. So thanks once again for joining us, everyone. We've had a great turnout today and it's been an excellent presentation and we look forward to joining you for next week's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.